Vladimir Makarov is the best villain in Call of Duty history, if not all of video game history. And Vladimir Makarov was not born a villain, he was turned into a villain. And I'm going to tell you the entire story of Vladimir Makarov and why he turned into a villain. Vladimir Makarov is driven by one thing. As a child born in 1980 Soviet Russia, he was a true child of the Soviet Union, indoctrinated in the ideals of the Soviet Union. He grew up in the suburbs of Moscow. He was the son of a high-ranking political figure who reaffirmed to his son all of the ideals of the Soviet Union. And a bright-eyed boy named Vladimir Makarov saw the Soviet Union as the golden light shining across the world. He was indoctrinated in the Soviet Union ideals, which were all reinforced by his father. His father, who was a high-ranking politician, always showed Makarov that the USSR was truly what everyone thought it was. However, the USSR, the Soviet Union itself, was fundamentally flawed, and he refused to accept this. Even when the wall fell in 1989, he refused to accept that the Soviet Union was failed. It wasn't until December 27th, 1991, that Makarov changed forever. The bright-eyed boy who had viewed the Soviet Union as the ideals, the principles of what to be in the world, came downstairs one morning to find his father hanging from the ceiling. And below his father's hanging corpse was a newspaper stating that the Soviet Union had officially been dissolved and no longer existed. This is where the bright-eyed boy who saw the Soviet Union as the light of the world turned dark. The boy who had idealized his father began to twist the image of what his father was. He began to despise his father's legacy as a politician, as that of a failure of a man and a failure of a protector of the Soviet Union. He began to resent the Russian government because they had failed to protect the Soviet Union and its collapse. He vowed not to make the same mistakes as his predecessors and began his lifelong obsession to restore Russia to its previous glory, a glory that it had not felt in years. And in the year 1998, after turning 18, he enlisted the next day in the Russian military and began his first steps on his journey to trying to restore Russia to supremacy, to the former glory it held. As Makarov began boot camp, he immediately got all eyes from his superiors on him because the Russian government and the Russian military had never seen a soldier like him, who was driven and motivated to be the best soldier he possibly could, and yet also a talented strategist with a mind unlike that that they had ever seen in the military. In his first year in the military, he developed a reputation of honor as the man who would get things done quickly and efficiently. But his record that was pristine after one year of service had become tarnished when he voluntarily signed up to help General Barkov invade Urzikstan in 1999. General Barkov had gone semi-rogue, and this operation to control and take Urzikstan was not backed by the Russian government, but instead it was backed by Imran Zakaev, an oligarch, a mafia boss, and most importantly, a head honcho in political decision making. And it was actually Imran Zakaev who partnered General Barkov and Vladimir Makarov together. Imran Zakaev revealed his beliefs of Russian supremacy and his dream of Russia dominating the world. And this was something that all four of the people in the room, the four horsemen, believed in. And the four horsemen were comprised of Imran Zakaev as the lead, his son Viktor, his Aki, his second in command. General Barkov was his powerhouse in the military, and Vladimir Makarov was a second in command who ensured that General Barkov's missions always got accomplished. However, Everything took a turn for the worse when the Urzikstan Liberation Force, in conjunction with Task Force 141, assaulted the gas production facility in Georgia, destroying it completely and killing General Barkov. Immediately after, the Russians were quickly pushed out of Urzikstan by the Liberation Force. And with the death of General Barkov, Vladimir Makarov experienced his first failure. As the person who was supposed to keep General Barkov safe, to make sure that General Barkov's plans were always enacted, he had bailed. And he started seeing these remnants of failure that his father had left behind that he believed were imprinted on him by his failure of a father, the failure of the USSR, and he hated this. Upon returning to Russia, the government and the military told him that the Urzikstan operation was over. Leave it be. Recognizing traces of the Soviet Union's previous failures in this response, Makarov pleaded with the supervisors to retake Urzikstan. But the Kremlin, who had not sanctioned or approved the attack and occupation of Urzikstan in the first place, refused and thought that Makarov was too radical and too deeply intertwined with the events of the occupation of Urzikstan to stay within the military. So with this in mind, the Kremlin stripped him of all military honors, his military rank, and dishonorably discharged him from the military. With no place left to go, he turned to the family who had supported General Barkov and him in the first place. He turned to the Zakaya family, who quickly signed him up for their own private military company called the Kony Group as the third in charge. Not long after Bakarov joined the Kony Group, the leader, Imran Zakaev, had fallen ill and actually proceeded to die of cancer, leaving all control of the Kony Group to Viktor Zakaev. 
and Viktor Zakayev, who was egged on by Makarov, decided that the best thing to do was to truly accomplish his father's mission. And so Viktor Zakayev and Vladimir Makarov planned and organized the invasion of Verdansk. An invasion that was only done to gain control of the nuclear missile silos within Verdansk and try to launch them at the west and at Urzikstan. However, we know that this failed. Vladimir Makarov had led an attack on the soccer stadium within Verdansk as a way to sow chaos while Viktor Zakayev tried to find and activate the missiles. However, Vladimir Makarov was quickly captured by Task Force 141, led by Captain Price. And not long after, Captain Price proceeded to throw Viktor Zakayev down the missile silo in Verdansk, presumably killing him. And so, with the invasion of Verdansk over, and all the people responsible for the invasion captured or killed, Task Force 141 turned around and handed Vladimir Makarov to Russia. And Makarov was quickly convicted of multiple life sentences for his actions in Verdansk and thrown into a maximum security prison. And at a bit of irony, his Russian superiors who had previously been in charge of him in the military and the government saw it fit that they put him in the Verdansk Gulag because it was not only the Gulag that he had sought to control and the country he had sought to control, but the conditions of the Gulag themselves would not be great. And the Russian government and military saw it as a fitting place to put Makarov to throw him into a bottomless hole, lock the hole, and then throw away the hole. However, Vladimir Makarov held a very high prestige in the Russian Gulag. As no one wanted to question him, and he was a high-ranking member of a political activist group, he could get anything that he wanted in the Gulag, including multiple burner phones so that he could control and conduct operations from the basement of a Gulag, locked up with only his phone, controlling the entirety of the Kony Group and the entirety of the Zakayev wealth. With nothing more than a burner phone, Vladimir Makarov planned and orchestrated the capture of the missiles in Modern Warfare 2 and delivery to the Alcatala terrorist so that they could use it against the United States. Vladimir Makarov was able to do this with a burner phone. And so Vladimir Makarov actually ended up orchestrating his own escape from the Gulag. Makarov is broken out of the Gulag in the first mission of Modern Warfare 3, Operation 627. And this is where we pull into his actual bio for the Modern Warfare 3 multiplayer that states, Now a liberated man, Makarov plans and intends to resume his operations in Urzikstan and against its allies, meaning America. And Makarov will not stop until Urzikstan is fully reclaimed or annihilated, and its allies pay their price for helping Urzikstan. And Vladimir Makarov is quoted as saying, If the Kremlin is too cowardly to play their hands, I will gladly force it on the rest of the world. And Vladimir Makarov does not plan to just win a war in Urzikstan. Vladimir Makarov plans to win a world war. He plans for Russia to retake the seat of power that he felt that it had held so long ago, and to restore Russia to its glory before the fall of the Soviet Union. But there is an interesting secret to Vladimir Makarov's bio in Modern Warfare 3. All of the operators in Modern Warfare 2 and Modern Warfare 3 can be listed as one of three things. Active, inactive, or killed in action slash deceased. Vladimir Makarov's bio that you had to force through multiple different menus and trick your way into stated that Vladimir Makarov was inactive, not deceased, not killed in action, not active, but inactive. Everyone else in the Modern Warfare 3 beta is listed as active. I'll let you theorize what that means. If you enjoyed the story, then you'll probably enjoy this story right here. This is the story of the Modern Warfare 2 raids and what it actually ties into, specifically involving the death of Hadir and the setup for Vladimir Makarov especially to come into Modern Warfare 3. So I think you'll like this video right here. And if you want to see something a little bit different, I was the last person to ever win a game of the original Warzone. And I'll have a link to that video right here. Make sure you subscribe down below because I am Icebergs, your Call of Duty informant. Stay frosty.